did not live in Moo Clay. One, right? One question. <laughs> that's, that's the problem with spell check. <laughs> oh, yeah, it doesn't catch that. Doesn't catch that. Thank you. I'll get that fixed. That's what that gift working on. I appreciate it. So mine will be a lot too. Uh, it's probably not the only one you can find. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, are you ready? Sure. Um, so, I'm I don't know if I've met you. So, I'm Jen. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm, I'm the Trillor. Trillor. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm the Director of Education and I work with the on Rendezvous. And, um, Jeannie, I know this is duplicate mm -hmm. for you, but um, what I wanted to do for everybody this morning before we focused on the specific station I need them to be at is talk about the Rendezvous event as a whole. Um, this is a culminating event for the academic year for fourth graders doing their state history curriculum. So we bring them out to the museum and we've done this since 2002 at the museum. The Rendezvous had a long history before it even came to the museum. It's over 30 years old. Um, this is a celebration of state history for the fourth graders, an opportunity for them to engage with hands-on activities, artifacts, specimens, um, go a little deeper in the curriculum than what they had been doing in the classroom over the course of the year. And as I remind all our presenters, we are not the primary conduit of the information that's been done in the classroom, or that enhancement, or the next extra step, or the special fun day for them um, when they come to the museum. Um, we really want to focus on what the museum can do differently from what the teachers are able to do in their classrooms. So I hope that's reflected in the station that you guys are facilitating this year. Um, as far as organization of the event goes, we have five theme areas or stations through the museum. We take classes of fourth graders and group them together, um, about 85 at most in a group, and they'll go to those five stations as a whole on a set schedule. So 85 in one track at, yeah. at that each station? Uh-huh, and then you'll do it five times over the course of the day. It's like the university classroom. Yeah, so we'll have- And there are going to be, a, like, each group of 25 kids, their teachers with them, as well as parents so chaperones. It's 85, there'll be two or three, three or four classes together. So, in any given group are 85 people plus uh -huh. the parents. 85 but students, 85 students, students plus so. parents and chaperones, teachers. Yeah, big crowd. <coughs> We've done it before, we'll be But okay. lots of adult help. That's lots what initially scared me. I'm alone with 85 fourth graders. <laughs> <laughs> You're not. Um, they have a tight schedule. This is not a free-for-all. They don't get to wander between stations. They are assigned to a specific rotation, a specific place each time period of the day. Um, there can be anywhere from 370 to just over 400 students on each of the four days of rendezvous. Um, on a Full day, your station will be run every single rotation. On one of the lower registration days, you may have a rotation off. I don't know, I don't have the numbers in front of me. No, you, you're planning us to be here for four days. No, well, you each signed up for a specific okay, day. Okay, okay, so, I thought I just had one day. What I don't know is on your specific day, if you'll have five rotations or, or four. four, you might get a rotation off. Odds are, are against it. You're probably going to have all five. So, heads up. It goes so fast. I've done this many, many years, and usually by my fifth rotation, I'm like, really? That's it? <laughs> it's really fast. Just time flies. Um, so, we have each station has a theme, and the themes are determined by the state curriculum standards. So Katie and I work directly with the curriculum standard facilitators at the district um, to identify these themes and design the stations. Um, this year the themes are based on human interaction with a specific thing. So human interaction with the night sky, it's an astronomy station. Fourth graders have an astronomy curriculum standard. So we'll introduce 
movements in the night sky, patterns that are recognizable in that show, and tie in the history as um, how the night sky was used for navigation by different groups of people. That sounds like an awesome station. Yeah, I can't Is wait to one? see it. Yeah. So do we get to go to the other stations if we have one off? Absolutely. The <laughs> dome. <laughs> that sounds the so dome cool. has limited seating, so the rotation sizes are based on the number of seats we have in the dome. What we might be able to do is talk to Ben and do a special showing for your lovely That would be awesome. Yeah. You guys can that see what they have like the saw. Room. Not to take away from these other then we have uh, humans interaction with technology and innovation um, so they're going to go up to the rooftop observation deck and they're going to have a scavenger hunt and a tally sheet and do comparing and contrasting the different forms of transportation technology that they see communications buildings uh, they'll go outside to the amphitheater, which is um, the little hillside in back. There's sandstone pavers they'll sit at, so that will be our outside station. We have always had good weather for this event. That's not real wood. <laughs> so we hope that continues this year. So we'll be outside, and we'll have, for our station, Cultural Diversity, all 85 kids are going to come, and they're going to sit in the amphitheater. You'll have a facilitator, and on... You know, there'll be a handful of you there each day, and we've got um, food samples and dancing that we're going to do with the kids, so we'll need extra sets of hands there. Um, so it may be that you're facilitating with this script, or it may be that you're helping hand out food. I don't have the So we don't chart. have to t present to you 85? might, but you might not. It depends on how many people are scheduled to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Something like riding a bike. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, from the amphitheater, they'll come inside to the exhibits and they're going to visit the biodiversity wall and talk about the fur trade. Um, and then here in the classrooms, we'll have uh, the human interaction with the non living environment. So we'll focus on the mineral well of Colorado. So the rotations are 30 minutes long, and then there's a few minutes of a passing period between each. And um, we'll be doing some kind of signal to let you know when your station is supposed to start. I think we were talking walkie talkies. Um, uh oh, is that dot? Thank you. Bye, Dot. We're still in the overview. Oh, okay. I know. Um, so each day we're asking volunteers to arrive at 8.30 to help set up the station. Um, but you also have a chance to have breakfast. PSD caters for so you have breakfast in the morning. And then we'll ask you, um, your last rotation ends at noon. We'll bring in supplies back here to the classroom and lunch is provided by PSD as well. It is always Do the kids eat lunch here too? Some of the school groups will stay and eat lunch on the grounds because you know they pack their right. sack lunches and they'll just be out. Um, out on the grounds <coughs> somewhere. We are not hosting them inside because that would be too many. Four <laughs> <laughs> hundred kids, yeah. Mm -hmm. one, one pop. Um, so it's really nice and generous of PSD to do that for us. So there'll be coffee in the morning. I know people need that too. You know, and it's always fun to regroup at the end of the day and um, share some of the humorous occurrences that are bound to occur. So the official end time is new. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thirty. I think what? Twelve thirty. Twelve thirty. Twelve thirty. Sorry. Nine thirty. Twelve thirty. Three hours. Five or two Okay. So some people have asked me about wearing costumes. Um, so we do stress that we try to be somewhat historically accurate in our clothing. Um, but most importantly is we um, really, in deference to our American Indian partners, we don't dress up as Indians. So no feather headdresses, war paint, bucks that we'd be amazed what they've done in the past. Um, but if you want to dress in a walking skirt and Victorian blouse or a prairie dress or something like that, all means. So, you do not want to 
not worry about it. Yep. <laughs> That's good to know. Skinny jeans would be fine. I don't, and I don't own those either, but I could wear jeans. Can we wear jeans? I guess I mean that. I usually wear uh, jeans and like a plaid flannel shirt because I tend to be at the mining station. I don't know where I'm going to be from day to day this so year. I've got an old yellow helmet left over. That'd be cute. I know, I don't want to wear it. Um, you can bring, you bring it and just leave it and donate it. You can be <laughs> <laughs> it. We'll take it. Okay, I'll find this one. Okay. Um, parking, the buses, the school buses are going to park here in our lot on the east side of the building and in the turnaround at the far northeast corner. So don't park over there. We're asking staff to park elsewhere. We're just not sure how tight parking is going to get. We're going to have potentially parent chaperones who drive here separately, volunteers from PSD, of course our museum volunteers, and we're still open to the general public, although we're posting on our website that this may not be your first choice to come on a day like this. Um, the garage. But the garage is just two right blocks block down. Is it just two? Yeah, yeah, a block and a half. It's so close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are options. I mean, there's street parking, too. Yeah. Street parking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, this year is some big changes for Rendezvous. We had a year off while we moved into this new building and the state adopted a new set of curriculum standards. So this was our opportunity to make some changes. And while I expect most teachers will greet this enthusiastically because we really looked at some of their comments in past surveys, there are gonna be some teachers who miss their old favorites. Um, panning for gold, we're not doing this year. That was a huge thing in past years. We've turned that into an outreach kit that teachers can check out. We haven't thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Those favorite things are available that they can do in their classrooms. Um, they should know that, but but it can be something that share. Yes, that you may hear some comments. So yes, they can check out the trunks in future years. Um, the important thing to remember is that the event is not for the teachers, the event is for the students. This is their first and only time. They have no experience, previous expectations to draw from. This is their one and only rendezvous. Um, but some of the things that we've addressed through the changes, um, we were really reliant on guest presenters to come in and talk about different stations. And because of that, we had no authority over content what the presenters were telling the students and was it aligning with curriculum standards. Um, we were dependent on when those volunteers were available to come in. And uh, we might have this great guest presenter for one session, but not for any of the others. So there's an inconsistency in what students were hearing and learning at the event. Uh, so by controlling the content and utilizing our own volunteers, we've addressed some of those issues um, but I do expect you may hear some teachers ask well where is this where is that like I said the best of the best we've turned into these trunks so they can always call us up and check those out so cultural diversity this is a station that is presentation focused. So there's going to be someone up at the front of this amphitheater who's doing this script. No one has to memorize this. This is kind of a guide to talking points that need to be hit. But we're going to look this year at three primary cultural groups in the state. The American Indians, the Hispanics, and the Germans from Russia. And we're going to talk about some of the ways those cultural groups continue to influence the state today and then some of the difficulties that they had. Um, the American Indians, the obvious difficulty they had is the immigration of Anglos in and the disruption of their way of life, which escalated into wars and then the eventual forced relocation to reservations. Um, part of what we want to do with each group, though, is provide a sample of a, a main food from their diet and listen to some music. So there'll be some music playing of Plains Tribe origin, and then we're going to let them sample um, some bison jerky, dried bison. Um, so the reason we need extra people at the station is to help pass that food 
out. Um, primary ideas that we want to talk about with the American Indians are that they were here for at least 13,000 years. So the culture may have changed over that time. We know it did um, through archaeology. But when you think about Hispanic and Anglo culture here as compared to 13,000 years of American Indian history, we think of like sort of just a fraction of human occupation um, of this landscape. Um, the Paleo Indians or the, the old Indians, that's what Paleo Indians mean, are um, very likely ancestral to the historic tribes that we recognize today, not just the Plains tribes here in the eastern part of the state, but the Utes up in the mountains, and then those um, southwestern tribes whose very northeastern corner of their territories does encompass Colorado. Um, so the, the Navajo, um, the Puebloans, the basket makers um, from the southwest corner of the state. We want to emphasize with the American Indians that their worldview is very distinct from the Anglos who arrived. So their world is ordered in circles, and they did not have a concept of individual ownership. So while a tribe would have a, a region of land that was traditionally theirs, there would be other tribes that were friends that would pass through there. There were tribes that were enemy, enemies that did not but nobody owned, and in fact, even within the, the band of a tribe, um, there was some communal ownership of items as well. So a family had a teepee, the woman was responsible for the teepee, the man had his hunting tools he was responsible for, but it, it wasn't ownership like we tend to think of it. Um, and Anglos is the it's a generic food. term. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so sometimes we'll refer to Americans, and we're talking specifically about the white people that were from the states. But we get into a fuzzy area when this area isn't states yet, or before the United States was even right. formed. We've got some history here with Hispanics that dates back to the 1700s in the San Luis Valley. So. Um, it's a little tricky there, but yeah, Anglo is, is okay. Um, everything they needed they, uh, for the Plains tribes they got from the bison uh, is another important idea, and they're nomadic. So they've got this range of land that they're moving through. They're following the bison herds, and everything's portable. All their tools, their homes, the TP designed to quickly move. Um, so we'll talk about the bison. As the, the item they get almost everything they need from because they don't have refrigerators and because they're moving a lot they would dry the meat um, it would still be very nutritious it's high in protein low in fat so very filling but they'd also um, grind it up and serve it with dried berries and that's called pemmican we call that the original um, power bar yeah <laughs> Sorry, I haven't, I haven't seen this before. Is there like a PowerPoint or uh, any kind of no, visual? Or just, we're just, it's just like a person? Yes, yeah, so someone's talking, and when we get to the point where we talk about the bison, we'll begin handing out the, okay. the bison jerky for people to try. Would while we're you talking. be standing around the bison so they could look at no, it? That's a different station. Oh, so, yeah. <coughs> outside. Yeah, oh, so that's outside. Yeah. Oh, it's outside. I've never Well, we'll have to mention <laughs> it. it if this keeps up, we'll be in the temporary gallery. But one of the things to, is to wear a hat to be able to change from, your face. I got go burn one year. Oh, okay. oh if it's a sunny day. It was very, yeah. yeah okay. It, it, but I, it's, yeah, I know, it's just a dumb move on my part. Mm -hmm. but not to play with it. But that was something that I wish I'm thinking about it. Since okay. it's a group of 85, when I've, when I've had smaller groups where we've taken them to a station and broken them down into their classes mm -hmm. and you can pass a laminated photo or two around, it works. With 85, mm, that's gotta be just contained. not sure. Yeah. Yeah, this where, is, where is it going to be, right? It's out in the amphitheater oh, on, the, on the north side of the building. There's a natural slope where okay. we put in sandstone pavers that the kids will sit on. Okay. And then we'll be down at the base. Okay. Um, 
we should have a PA system so all the kids can hear us. A um, couple of things I wish we could do. Well, we have some issues. We used to have a teepee, and I would love to have the teepee up, but it was vandalized right before we moved. Um, and lodge, yeah, lodge poles were broken, and uh, so we have to replace it. That's, that's an expense. So this year we don't have the teepee, and I'm anticipating that'll be another thing some of the teachers are missing. Um, Do you have a little teepee, like a pig style teepee, that you could just sit in and just making the kids have no idea what that looks like? I know they've studied it so often, so clearly they have. Mm. Yeah. Nice what I could do is multiple copies of each picture so we, we can, can make do it, it by rows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a children's market mm -hmm. you can buy a kid yeah. size one. And yeah, but then they're not nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know, is that many Or just any other visuals that would be awesome? Well, you'll, we have other things. Okay, the, cool. the American Indian one is a little slim on things. We'll have the bison, but for the other two, you'll see we'll, okay. we'll be getting up and doing some other things. Um, so we do want to make a point that when other people first arrived in this area, there was a spirit of cooperation before between the American Indians and um, the newcomers, if you will. Uh, and that's where you get the history of the fur trade, which is a whole other station. So we're not going to go into that too much here, but we will say that the American Indians shared information about where resources could be found and um, weather and climate and what to expect living in this area. And in return, the newcomers brought things like metal and um, glass beads and fabrics that they would trade. So the American Indians had their furs and pelts and they in exchange received the glass beads and the, the metals, guns. Um, but when you get an increase in the newcomers, we start to see conflicts developed. Some of the biggest problems were the arrival of the ra railroad and again the concept of ownership where the Anglos would come in, they would claim areas of land, they would fence it off, and then suddenly areas that the Plains tribes were able to freely move through before and they had to be moving around and they, they just did not have this concept of fencing off land. Um, so <coughs> conflicts increased and um, misunderstandings happen all the time. There's, there's a great story if you ever read particularly women's diaries of Western migration they will often refer to begging Indians and what was happening actually is um, the tribes on their traditional lands expected people who were traveling through to pay a tribute, some food or other desired items. And so they would approach the wagon trains for their tribute payment, holding out their hands, and the immigrants interpreted that as the Indians were begging. Now, it's absurd to think that they survived for thousands of years on this landscape without anyone to beg from, but because of the lack of ability to communicate, lack of understanding of worldview, um, we see increases in conflicts and then eventually we escalate into full-fledged war. Now we refer to this time period as the Indian Wars because it was truly a series of wars. They began in the east and as the Anglos moved west and um, interloped into additional tribes, traditional lands, to have more conflicts with each successive tribe. So for the tr Plains tribes here, by the 1870s, 1880s, um, the conflicts ended here and they were forcibly relocated to reservations in Wyoming and South Dakota. And so the descendants of those people still live there today. Uh, I don't know if this applies. They also killed all their buffalo. Yes. So with the They're arrival rural, of rural the railroads, they just killed them by thousands. Mm -hmm. So that's addressed in again the fur trade okay. station, okay. where we'll talk about just the the hunting of bison going from. There are estimates of anywhere from sixty to a hundred million bison on this continent in eighteen hundred, and by nineteen hundred, it's generously estimated at fifteen hundred remained. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And the bulk of that hunting happened in the 1870s. Just millions of animals per year. Um, 
So one of the things I like to talk about with worldview related to the American Indians is, is they think in circles. So there's the medicine wheel, there's the round teepee. Um, bands would set up their teepees in a circle. So you could look out your teepee and see a whole community just ringed around there. All your, all your teepees would face east because you're thinking about the circle of the rising and then the setting sun. When the people are forcibly relocated to reservations, they were usually put into cabins by families. So you go from a round home where there is no dark corner into a square home where you have corners and they are dark. Um, I, I can't even imagine what that would do to your mind. The cabins were arranged in a, along a street, a road. So you'd look out your front door and you can't see your community. So to go from round to linear and circles to squares, I think it's just it's nicely done in that exhibit. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you think so. Um, so then we'll move on to Hispanics um, as the next significant group to arrive in Colorado. Now, they don't really come to the Northeast until um, the 1920s for the sugar beet industry but we're thinking about state history for this event. So um, they are moving into the southern part of the state at least by 1840, and I, I think there is um, every reason to believe they were here even earlier than that. Well, San Luis. San Luis Valley. Settled. What is that called? The term of San Luis. Mm, early or late. 1600s, isn't it? You know, I was yeah, trying to it's like give like an exact 16, date. It's really early. Puts Jamestown a little uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me double check the date for you guys. Yeah, that would be good to know. Yeah, because we were settled at 1580 or something. So the difference, yeah, the difference is the yeah exploring versus settling. Mm -hmm. And so when mm -hmm. I was looking that up for the San Luis Valley, they're saying settling and farming at least by 1840, and they they weren't addressing the. Exploration. Yeah, exploration. Exploration. But I think they were up there with cattle yeah. even yeah. earlier. Yeah. Which is an important thing that we want to bring up that, yeah, we had beat workers here in the Northeast, but some of those really early Hispanic arrivals are vaqueros, and that's our cowboys. ancestors who are traditional American cowboy. Um, he's got nothing on those vaqueros, right? Yeah, so we're going to talk about that. Um, Las Amas River. Yeah. Yes. Cortez on his people yeah. that are well blended and melded into that culture down in the four corners area. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, very old yes, very history old. there. Um, so, some of the things they bring with them, of course, the cowboy culture um, and then adobe bricks. So, what do you do in a landscape where you don't have timber to chop down and build a cabin? You're forming adobe bricks out of straw, packed into a frame, and then packed with mud, sand, silt, water, and letting that, oh, and clay, and letting that harden in the sun. Um, so some of the oldest structures in Colorado are of adobe, and we do have some adobe structures here in Fort Collins as well, over in the three columns. And then we talk about food. I am still waiting to get confirmation from PSD on whether we can do the corn tortillas and the beans. We're good to go on the beans, but we're trying to get the corn as well. Hmm. So we'll talk about how the corn was ground into flour and then that dough was shaped into a, a flat, round, and heated, and that's what we call a tortilla. You could fry that up to make it crispy or serve it soft. And then in our part of the world, um, the Hispanics usually were making their refried beans from pinto beans. So in other parts of Latin America, they might use different beans, but northern end, they tended to use pintos. And so they'd soak them overnight, stew them, drain the liquid, mash them, strain them to remove the skins, and then either bake or they could fry. Well, we call them refried beans, and in this paragraph, there's an explanation of it's actually a mistranslation. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times they're baking, they're not frying at all, but mm -hmm. it's certainly not twice frying, mm -hmm. as the term refried would imply. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it actually means just well fried. The R-E prefix in Spanish just means well, mm -hmm. well fried. 
but the kids, we hope, will get a little tortilla chip and some refried beans as um, what they can eat. Yeah. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. These poor kids, though, between the bison and the refried beans and then the little kraut burger samples, they'll get later and be really um, fresh when they get home that night <laughs> <laughs> for their parents. Um, and then we'll do dancing. So we have a um, Mexican hat dance music that we'll turn on. And this is another example where I'd love to have the clothing. I might, I might not, but maybe we'll do the pictures instead of the women in their beautiful, ruffled, brightly clothing, bright skirts and um, dress tops, and the men dressed in that traditional vaquero um, outfit, the black with the silver buttons on the side. Yeah. And what a wonderful visual. Yeah. I'm trying to see what we can borrow from the Romero house instead of And there, there are. And that's mm -hmm. the problem. We can get them for one session, but we couldn't necessarily get them for oh. all. Mm -hmm. So, oh. yeah. It's okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so that's why we're, we can provide teachers with that contact information if they'd like to arrange for mm -hmm. classroom visits. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Yeah. So. But yeah, so some kids got to see them in past years, and other kids, exact same year, would come in and they didn't get to. They certainly can see them. Yeah. The West But it's hard for us. You know, it's a frustration that, for the inconsistency and experience for the kids, but it's also hard for us. Like, well, what do we do for that same time frame mm -hmm. on the other yeah, sessions yes. when we don't have the dancers? Mm -hmm. So. Um, Anyway, we'll have the sombrero, and I'd love to bring a couple kids up and have them do a Mexican hat dance. So, um, we talk to yes, you about yeah. Well, yeah, not really, but we'll talk, you know, it's important to tap your feet if you're the man, and you're clapping your hands, and you're trying to get the woman's attention, and she wants nothing to do with you. <laughs> that's it. That's the wooing part of the dance. And then he, he gets frustrated, he throws his hat down, and they do begin to dance together. So that's why I forgot the laptop to pull it up on YouTube. <laughs> so now is there going to be some, I mean, what about turning on music and stuff? Yes, is so. Is person, are we going to do that? Or? We'll have to figure it out by each session. So when you come in at 8.30, so whoever else is with you that day, we'll say, okay, this is the person who's facilitating, and your responsibility will be clicking on the CD at the time, and you're going to be the bison jerky and a router. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So that's what we'll do each morning going over your session. Oh, 
have to. There's audio. Yeah. He hasn't thrown down his hat in frustration yet. Oh. Whoa. Yeah. Is this, does this look right? The tapping? Yeah, it's the same song. Yeah. Okay, well this is straight from YouTube, not reliable. I don't know what version is. So difficulties for the Hispanics that we want to address, um, you know, even though they have such a long history in Colorado, in areas that they moved into after um, the Anglos were here, so like Fort Collins with the sugar bean industry in the 1920s, they did face prejudices. Um, we have some signs in our collection that refer to white trade only or no Mexicans. There's one really offensive one that's no Mexicans or dogs. Yeah. I remember that here in the yeah. 1950s. Yeah. Well, they were all yeah. uh, down by Andersonville, too. And we'll address that comes up in the Germans from Russia section, but there's yeah. a great deal of discrimination just about where they lived in the community, the name um, that those neighborhoods were called, the jungles. Yeah. The jungles. We got it. So then we'll talk about the Germans from Russia. So they are they arrive at the state in the state after Hispanics, but in this part of the uh, state they were here first. Um, so they come right about the turn of the century, 1900, and they come to work in the sugar beet industry. Um, and they have um, an interesting history. They're German ancestry, but the families had immigrated from Germany to Russia and they were there for 150 years, and then they came to the U.S. So um, they're Germans, they spoke the German language, they're primarily Lutheran, um, they maintained their German identity while they were in Russia, and it was when they started losing opportunities to maintain their German identity, where they were being told they couldn't speak German anymore, when they were being told they had to serve in the Russian yes. army, they began leaving. Yeah, was coming here. Yeah. 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 Big, big I mean, change with the czar and the whole political system over yeah. there, too. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was all happening. So it was, it was Catherine's invitation yeah. in the 1700s, and she was German-born, so that's why the Germans responded. She needed people to fill up her borders. She had a big problem with Asiatic, you know, 
nomads raiding um, the country. So she extended an invitation to all of Europe, but you know the Germans responded because she was a countrywoman by birth. So they went, um, and her son upheld her promises to the Germans, but her grandson did not. So he began revoking those promises, and that's when they began to leave. Now, some went to Argentina, and so there's, German, there's a big German-Russian population in Argentina, but a lot came to the Central Plains states of the U.S., so up into the Dakotas, Kansas, Nebraska, here into eastern Colorado. Um, and they, like I said, they came and they worked the beef industry. There's some things they gave us. Oh, I should have put this in the script. I'll have to reissue this for you guys. I'll give you a little more background on the GFR, what I just said to you. Um, when they came, they brought seeds with them, and intermixed in those seeds um, were seeds for Russian thistle, and that's the origin of our, uh, <laughs> you can see the origin of our tumbleweeds here. Um, they love sunflower seeds, and so you'll hear stories of the little old German-Russian men sitting um, along storefronts on Linden Street, because they would just walk over from the jungles, and they'd sit there and eat their sunflower seeds, but other people in town called them Russian peanuts, and that was the way they'd say Russian. It was kind of a discriminatory way. Even though they were not Russian, they called them the Russians, the dirty Russians, and they're Russian peanuts. They're just sunflower seeds. Um, there's something else I was going to say. They loved bright colors. Their homes in Russia were painted like sky blue. Well, all of the Easter eggs, is that? Kind of part of that art? No, that's yeah. another part of your yeah, art. Different, different Russian. Okay. Yeah, the Fabergé stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, because they are culturally German, their music has that polka okay. flavor to it. Um, and some of the German Russian traditions for weddings are things that we see still today. So, they used to take um, a cane. When a, a man's daughter was getting married, he would take a, a cane around to the neighbors to invite them to the wedding, and if they accepted, they would tie a ribbon to it. So we can give some of the kids along the front row ribbons and um, have them tie that on as we're talking about German-Russian weddings. Um, so that's how you accepted your invitation. So to tie a ribbon onto a cane, and then the weddings were held in churches, but afterwards you would go to a family farm and have a Dutch hop, and that's what the Germans from Russia call their dance, um, the Dutch hop. A little turn, it has a very polka-esque flavor to it. This CD is from some German, a German-Russian band here in Fort Collins called Adolf. And friends. <laughs> it's not a great CD, and I was laughing with Katie the other day. It sounds really staticky. They must have. Did they do it on purpose? No, I think they probably taped it on reel to reel and then converted <laughs> it to a CD. So. It's a two, it's sort of a shuffle by two steps. So you stand on my left side and with both hands, there you go. And then left foot, two, two. Is that like a two step? Yeah, it's just a little two step. But if you're really good, the man can turn, turn the woman around and then you. Well, as you're moving. I can't do it. I fall over. <laughs> we'll get some kids up and let them try doing a little two-foot shuffle, a little hop, a little spin. That's it. That, yeah. If you're really good, you can do those fancy things. <laughs> All right, and then we'll talk about the Kraut Burger. I kind of don't want to give away to the kids what's in the cow burger because I'm afraid they'll hear it and be like, I'm not going to eat it. So we'll say this is kind of the German-Russian version of a hamburger. So it's the ground beef in a little dough pocket. Now we're not going to do the full-on 
Kraut Burger this year. We're just going to give them a taste of the filling, so we'll pass that out and ask the kids if any of them can figure out what that right. secret ingredient <laughs> is. Um, so how is it, is it going to be in a little cup? It's filling. Yeah. PST Catering is taking care of it. Right. That's my guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, there is one on the May. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. May yeah. and Drake yeah. in the Sunflower yeah. Market. But I'm asking the the East. East. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. That's a question, yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, is that? Okay. Yes, I like this question. That's what I'm asking. It's a go around to the east side of that building. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's on the I do like Starbucks, and then there's the pizza place, and then yeah. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so years and years ago, there was um, a little restaurant here on North College. I think it's the Screaming Peach now. <laughs> it used to be owned by a little German-Russian couple, um, Oren Uric, and they called it uh, Das Gravel House. Oh. It was so good. And they sold it. It was really short. Yeah. At Old Steel's down here in the St. Joe's, they sold real good. Yeah. Crab burgers. You can get them at King Supers, too. Sixties, yeah. Theirs aren't as good. No, these they make especially real ones. They do it. Get your bid in. Make fries, make bags. Schmidt's Bakery down in Loveland. Mm -hmm. They close. Makes they close. Mm -hmm. When did they close? Well, well, well they had their time. They closed many times, and the last the one, I think they hauled everything away. Yeah, it was a mess. The crowd is more recent. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like last month. Like yeah, it was like last month. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. so yeah. uh, they had, they probably had the best. <sighs> yeah, it's just. You know, the, the historian talked is there anything about the beef farm? Well, we talk about, where is that? Oh, the last thing in the 20s. Yeah, Be again, because it's state history, we want to say there's beet farming and the, the vaqueros with the cowboy, but I didn't want to spend too, too much time, time on that. Um, because they are mostly beet workers up here. Yeah, yeah. 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 lots of ranching. Ranching and the such a central part of our yeah, yeah it was, and it's it huge. As yeah. grandparents here would yeah. probably have seen that. Because a lot of the Russians yeah. uh, worked in the beating. Uh, in yes, the and that's industry. that's mission too. My biggest concern is all these stations are new. We have 30 minutes, and do I know we can do this in 30 minutes? Ooh, yeah, I don't. This so just passing out food. Yeah, it is. So think of it as like 10, 10, 10. Ooh, yeah, yes. points to address. Yes, we have freeze-dried beets. I've got a handful of these. Um, we have another one, but it's checked out right now to a school. Um, but I tell the kids, this is freeze-dried, so it's had the water removed. If the water was still in, it would be a little bigger and obviously heavier. But this gets you a sense of the color and the shape. They have the big green leaves over the Those top. Those wooden beets that are out on the display, I, I've never seen a beet that big. They're kind of stylized okay. for the exhibit. Okay. Yeah. Bigger. To give the kids an idea, because a lot of the young children used to go out and oh my gosh, handle yeah. those and chop the tops off. That's what they did. Some of the biggest beads, one. like there's a record breaking <laughs> yeah. weight of 19 pounds. It was kind of stupid. We have a bunch of that weight. We have a bunch of seeds, Chalar. You can. Um, mostly what they're used for is to extract sugar from. Right, right, they do right. But yeah, they chop it up into um, like discs okay. and then they boil it. There to used to be a beef factory down yeah, in Loveland. I used to know there was one. There, they were all there. Were there Thirteen all, of them along the farm. And then right. actually along the trail uh, around next, uh, along the Poudre River, that whole field is kind of white and chalky. Oh, yes. Because that. That was all these. So they they, they also had out. their byproduct yeah. from the factory was dumped there. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they end up with kind of a sludge. They boil. They call it cosets, C-O-S-E-T-T-E-S, 
when they sliced up the beets and they boil that um, to dissolve the sugar out. And then they would take that fluid and run it through some more heating processes and centrifuging to separate out the fluid from the actual sugar. But then they'd be left with that sludge from the cosettes and that would get dumped and that yes, was dumped that over that it. Whole, that whole feel, if it's yeah. Yeah. Then they used to make a silage too. Yeah. That, that got where big feedlots were. Mm -hmm. So when you got into the area of Greeley, Windsor, I mean, all, all of this out here, there were the big feedlots that fed into Montreux and stuff. There was a distinctive smell mm -hmm. that went with yeah. the sugar beet fed so cattle. So my yeah. understanding, mm -hmm. well, or whatever they mean. There's multiple layers of smell from my understanding. <laughs> um, it's awful. During the the harvest season was late October into November, about three weeks. And beets, when they're pulled from the ground, begin metabolizing their sugar. So they want to get these up to the factory pretty quick. Um, so the families would work pretty much sun up to sun down, pull the beets out, chop the leaves off the top, toss these into wagons, later into trucks. And then those were taken to what are called beet dumps, located along the railroad lines. And railroads would come along and pick up the beets from the dumps take them into the factory and there are these pictures of just these endless mounds of beets around the factories. But they got them processed as fast as they could and so it was done in this really defined period of time during the year and that process of boiling the slices of beets apparently was pretty stinky. Yeah, I've heard so that's what I remember as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Was come, uh, we'd come here and you could always begin to get that smell somewhere. Out yeah, in the so eastern part. <laughs> yeah, and they, I mean, it was out somewhere. And you'd start with, and it was, and you'd see the, the people in the field sometimes, and you saw different parts of it. But yeah. it was, the explanation I always got of the stinky smell it wasn't just the cattle, it was. I was going to say, is it worse than the feedlots? No, it, but it came it's up right with the feedlots. Yeah. It, it was a yeah. part of that yeah, whole because thing then that it, was different than other feedlot areas. It's so like you said, the silage went to cattle. Um, the beet tops were fed to sheep, mm -hmm. so they were kind of recycling in the fields. We still get whiffs of that. I don't know if it's the same. When it thaws and the wind will blow, you'll, you'll get the same kind of picture. And I've always wondered, how deep did it go? Oh, you know, it, there's a funny little smell that comes in. Mm -hmm. If you live like out in the northeast, I don't know, like southeast. It, it's a Colorado cattle feedlot smell that's peculiar uh -huh. to our, I and I always learned it was from the sugar beet. Rooftop here and smelled yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, 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 and it gets real warm, you'll pick, there's a real distinct, it was one of the things we used to laugh at. Yeah. Cow manure, where was it? I was saying that to my friend. Yeah, some of those yellow scratches. And this is the smell of the car. I didn't know that, so you wanted to ask. But you picked it up, so you'll, yeah. That thing is white inside then. That's why that field that you were speaking of is white. Yeah, because yes, I yes, went yes. A little tour and they talked about the dumping, and I thought, white, I can't. Well, and there I may was, be some. I think it uh, be red. Well, I think there may be some limestone. I think they did it too yeah. as part of the purifying. Yeah, process. I think the limestone oh, yeah. too. It's because it's chunky, and I've noticed there's not a lot of stuff growing in it. Is it? Oh, no. Does it kind of. Uh, what do I want to say? Kill the soil or whatever? Because I, I don't see, I mean, I've I just ridden that bike trail for 20 years and it looks sterile. Mm -hmm. The soil looks sterile, possibly. I, I thought it was going to be cleaned off of there at some point. They are working to our store. Oh, maybe, maybe, yeah. they, okay. maybe they just have to haul that out because it's business forever. Exactly. Yeah, where, yeah. Does that, where does it go where from there? It go? <laughs> it's definitely a site they want to clean. As for eating these beets, as is, that can be done. Um, I know you can roast them. So we got to go out to Ron Kefter's farm a year ago, and we harvested some beets ourselves with our beet knife. Did you <laughs> know it was so hard. Oh, <laughs> we were just pathetic. chopping one. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Like well, you you well, are cheese. supposed to rip them up out of the ground just by the leaves, and none of us could do it. We would stay in there. <laughs> if we even got any success at all, we would have broken the beat in half. 
I don't know how Because it was kind of chunky and, and broke up and oh, angled. So ended. hard. Yeah, yeah, really hard. But we brought some back and we chopped them up and we roasted them and they were really good on the like, salad. So they roasted them in the oven? Yeah, like, we just like roasted them in the oven. Mm -hmm. like, like, mm -hmm. Garden are good. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And then I've heard stories, I told you guys that this morning, that kids used to line the roads during the campaign, that's what they called the harvest time, and you know, beets would bounce off the truck, so they'd pick up the beets, run them home, throw them in the oven, and the sugar would caramelize, and so they would just cut off the outer layers of the beet to get that really sweet, sweet yeah, <laughs> taste. I don't think it's a taste for everyone. Like my daughter, there's no way, but I thought on salad it was pretty good. The thing is, you can't just walk into any old grocery store and buy yes, sugar is. beets. Yeah. Probably not at all, I don't think. I've never seen them. There's, There's some little ones. tiny ones at the farmer's market in the summer that they call sugar beets, but I mean, they're just they tiny, like herb. every like, all the other kinds. Like inside. other beets? Yeah. And, and some of them are even yellow inside instead of red, mm -hmm. and those are very, very sweet. Mm -hmm. We buy them all the time at the farmer's market. Okay. And they're really good. Oh, well, they're it's like, like, it's like, like a little like bulb or something. Steam them and eat them. Yeah, yeah maybe they're, they're young. So Very young. Very yeah, young. maybe. Okay. Okay, so food. Um, discrimination for GFR. They, just like the Hispanics, had to deal with that. Um, primarily because, you know, they arrive in 1900 and then within we're 20 years we're at war. Oh, and then the yes. women. And then the fuck of Russian war was, where they, because that was part of yeah, the of the birth really and voting, mm -hmm. to some of the upheaval that went into that. Mm -hmm. So the women wore pretty um, identifiable scarves. Hmm. And so, you know, they wore head shawls. And so you can imagine they go shopping in Old Town and they're immediately identified as Germans, even though they hadn't lived in Germany, their families hadn't been there in 150, 200 years. They've been in Russia for that length of time. They faced some. Um, it's kind of ironic cool too clothes. that we have so much issue with scarves now. No, I mean that, that Red Middle Red Eastern Red women Red are. Oh, yeah. She's got a cool scarf. No, I mean that <laughs> Middle Eastern <laughs> women are identified. I love yeah. them. Yeah. People <laughs> criticize people say wear their scarves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. I mean, it would use that as a marker, though. <coughs> it certainly did for the German-Russian women way back when. Um, so a lot of German-Russians will tell you that their families maintained the German language in the home until World War II. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. then their parents said, we're, we're speaking English. And so they lost. Mine stopped good. Did they? They weren't German-Russian. Germans, but yeah, because of this tradition here yeah. against Germans. There were some, I think, some serious events in the European mutt Americans, but yeah. It's, it's that good yeah. yeah. Um, so they had taunting, they were taunted, and people identified the women by the scarves, of course, the German language. Um, but the Germans from Russia, who first arrived in 1900, 1902, established two of the neighborhoods that are on the northeast side of town by what used to be our sugar beet factory, which is today's city streets department, that big brick building out there, that was the factory. So there's Buckingham and Andersonville, were the two neighborhoods that the German-Russians built. And then when the um, Hispanic families came in to work the beet fields, there was a third neighborhood established, and that one's called Alta Vista. Well, collectively, um, Buckingham, Andersonville, and then later on with Alta Vista, those neighborhoods were called the jungles. And that was a derogatory term that implied wildness, dirty, um, that even the newspaper would just call it the jungles. And people talk about, you don't go to the jungles after dark. And, and yeah. was, but these were family neighborhoods. But that was a, a mix of Hispanic and Russian. There was a short period of time. Um, so the first 
15 to 20 years or so, the neighborhoods, Andersonville and Buckingham, are primarily German Russian. And what happened during that time is those families um, saved up enough money that they were then either leasing or purchasing their own farms and moving out of the neighborhoods and onto their own homesteads. And so the factories are left needing new kind of seasonal workers, if you mm -hmm. do, and at that point they turned their attention to recruiting in Hispanic workers. So they move into the neighborhoods beginning mm -hmm. in the 1920s, and then there's enough of them that they also build a third neighborhood at Alta Vista. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, Japanese were burning them also. Yeah. They, I mean, that's another, not very, but that was another, that was another group. That, yeah, but that then they were, in World War II, we had internment camps out around, was it around yeah. Fort Moore? Yeah. 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 yeah, two or three of them in the state. Yeah. Yeah. I met a little lady who was in one of those camps yeah. the other day. We go to a support group at the hospital. She needed a ride. We picked her up. She's 92, lives over in the Worthington. Um, and that was one of the first things that she wanted to tell me that she mm -hmm. was in the Japanese internment camps here in Colorado. And that's why she lives here, because she yeah. was sent here. But she but stayed. Well, a lot of them have the big farm. They, they stay, stay here, and a lot of them have, mm -hmm. like around Longmont, a lot of the big yeah. farms are yeah. Japanese families. Yeah. They were able to get jobs. They did. Or they built their, you know, they just started. That's what they did. They came from like the Seattle, Washington area. And that, they just continued what they knew. Yeah, here in California. Yeah, California, mm -hmm. all along there. That's where they were all shipped out from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So does this is a, a huge amount of information. Does the presenter have some time to get her to end it? So there's these wonderful yeah, good things well, that you think about, or at that. least, or at least ending it, or at least, it. Or at least it has no, to be ended. no, no. But as a presenter, one right. needs to have. I mean, can't just go and end it at the jungles and say we're done and go on to the next stage. But we might. Yeah. <laughs> the bell rings. No, no, no. What I would encourage all the students to do is to go home that night and talk to their families about their where heritage and where they're from and mm -hmm. what their families' experiences were, wherever they arrived first. Um, How that ties in. Maybe you are German. Just German. some logical conclusion to all these mm -hmm. things. I mean, you think uh, at any presentation yeah. level. It's, yeah. You can't just say yeah. we're done, kids. Yeah. Well, we hope we don't. We hope that the bell doesn't ring in there running on and we have not gotten through it. I just don't know. This is going to be one of those stations we learn a lot on Tuesday about how it's working. Um, it's also why we're happy so, to have the hands. So Twitter are one, because uh, Linda Lloyd, you know, the works with you, she, she has done a lot of history on the area. And she actually directed me. To, there's actually some really good videos that she has done about the bee farming, you know. Yeah. So there's a lot of information out there that the kids are, I don't know. No, I'm just, access no, I'm just talking about, no, because, I'm just talking about point blank presentation style. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it just has nothing we'll to do with tie it up. that it's got to have some kind of jazzy thought, let's bring this together, oh, rather than, jazzy. Well, or, <laughs> some, <laughs> or something to leave the kids. I mean, just, just something, yeah. this is a yeah, sampling or whatever. What we really want to do is make well, relevant. Yes, what, so the what, mining station, hopefully they leave with a better sense of And the purpose of this is to have them a better sense appreciate of, cultural of our diversity. cultural diversity and the richness mm -hmm. of where we as a city have come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely ties yeah. to Fort Collins, even though it's a state history yeah. event. Yeah. Like when we were talking about the American Indians statewide, we've got the Plains Indians here in the east, but we've got you know, the cliff dwellings are part of our state as well. well we just decided that we wanted to re-emphasize what they experienced in second grade and, and focus just on the Plains tribes. It's a lot of it. Yeah, you can kind of generalize and make them